Thousands of years ago, the last of the North American glaciers disappeared from these lands. As those vast sheets of ice melted and receded northward, they left behind a precious legacy, water, forming thousands of lakes, rivers, and streams. These waters brought life, creating a world of natural treasures. The first people to inhabit this land shared a mystical relationship with their world. The sun and the birds, the water and the fish, the wild game and manoman, or wild rice. Wild rice is not a true rice, but it is a grain, possibly North America's only native cereal grain. It is classified in the genus Zizania, a grass which is mainly found in the shallow, slow-moving waters of northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and neighboring parts of Canada. The grain is well suited for this harsh northern climate, for the seeds may lie dormant for years in the cold underwater soil. But although it can survive the hard winters, wild rice is actually a very fragile plant. The young leaves are easily drowned out by high water levels from a heavy snowmelt or spring rains. The growing plants compete for space with the more tenacious weeds, and their delicate stems and flowers must hold up against the capricious northern summer. By late August, the mature seeds begin to ripen and shatter or fall off the plant, providing a last meal for the ducks before their flight southward. In the face of all these odds, only one year in every four yields a bountiful crop. The Ojibwe called September the wild rice moon. Each year, the rice harvest is a time to break away from the routine of daily life and partake in an ancient custom. Because the wild grains ripen gradually, the harvest is drawn out over several weeks, requiring many repeated, careful passes through the rice beds. For this purpose, the traditional harvesting equipment is still the best. A narrow and lightweight canoe, forked pole, and cedar flails, which gently brush only the ripened kernels from the plant, allowing the immature grains to ripen for a later harvest. This is how wild rice has been gathered for thousands of years, back to the times of the mound building cultures of the upper Mississippi. Even with these ancient methods, on a good day an experienced team can harvest up to several hundred pounds of manoman, the good berry. Minnesota and Wisconsin regulate the harvest with a set of laws designed to prevent the mechanical exploitation of the native crop. But once picked, the rice finds an open market. For many people, it is a staple food and will be kept as an important part of their diet for the entire year. For others, it means cash, a precious commodity in the hard-pressed Northwoods economy. Commercial buyers compete for the picker's rice, creating a classic speculator's market, with prices changing daily in response to quality and supply and demand. Once the green rice has been picked, it must be cured for storage. This process involves three basic steps, parching, thrashing, and fanning to separate the grain from the chaff. Guy Green finishes his rice using a combination of traditional methods and some newer technology. You know, you don't want to, when you're parching rice like this, you don't want to parch it too quick. Otherwise, it, you tend to scorch it, and then when you uh, cook it, you can taste that scorched taste in the rice. Well, you let it, you gotta let it cool off. And then, uh, then you put it right in the thrasher here. Start thrashing on it. Takes the hull off. Then you put it into the fanning mill. 
My dad bought that uh, when he was living down in Princeton. He bought that from Sears Roebuck. There's three screens in there, and in order to get the right one, you, you know, he had to go by trial and error and fan it out and then run it through a couple times. If the fanning mill doesn't take it all out, then you'll, you'll have to fan it out by hand. You can get it just as clean as that fanning mill, probably cleaner with a, with a birch bark basket, you know, fanning dish. I never had wild rice before, coming from France. Uh, but uh, it was a wonderful discovery for me because uh, I can see all the possibilities and how special it is. It's uh, no comparison with uh, other vegetables like uh, rice or potatoes. It has a lot more distinctive uh, flavor. It's a little smoky flavor. That's what is very interesting. And you can uh, really develop this taste with all the different uh, flavor. But first, we, uh, we cook it in a, in a broth. And usually, we use the broth of the duck or of the, the meat you are preparing. And with this broth, you cook your raw rice. And when the raw rice is cooked, of course, you drain it. And after that, you uh, saute in the fat of the duck. You saute a little bit of uh, bacon, smoked bacon and a little bit of onions and mushroom. Of course, if you use wild mushroom, it's give a better flavor. And all the spice, all the spice you, you like. Of course, to be French, I like the Provencal spice, which is a mix of uh, five uh, basic uh, uh, spice. And what is nice when the duck uh, release a little bit of the juice, he soaks the wild rice, and it gives a wonderful flavor. And uh, you serve that very hot and carve at the table. Voilà le canard riz sauvage tout en couleur. Wild rice can be found growing naturally across almost all of eastern North America. But its traditional home is around the western Great Lakes and Mississippi River headwaters. Although recent archaeological discoveries tell us that wild rice has been harvested here for thousands of years, actually little is known about it prior to the early European expeditions into this area. While the British were busy looking for a Northwest Passage, the French set their eyes on a lucrative fur trade with the native Sioux, Ojibwe, and other Algonquin tribes. Here they found a way of life untouched by time, an annual cycle of hunting, fishing, and gathering rice. Soon the grain became an item of trade, for it was a convenient and nutritious food during months of travel and hardship. The decline of the fur trade was followed by the growth of a young nation and a great struggle for control of the timber and mineral resources of wild rice country. As white settlers came to dominate the landscape, the native tribes were forced to resolve their differences and resettle on reservation lands. Treaties specifically protected traditional hunting grounds and rice lakes, the objects of generations of tribal wars and rivalries. Ancient customs were preserved, such as the ceremonial first harvest and the tying of heads to define territory and prevent loss to birds in bad weather. The rice harvest became more than just a food gathering event. It symbolized a culture whose very survival was at stake. But in spite of the differences that separated the new Americans from the native tribes, wild rice always brought them together. Wild rice became one of the most important economic resources of the Ojibwe people. By the turn of the 20th century, Wild rice had achieved national status as one of our native delicacies. It began to appear on the dining tables of the Eastern establishment, procured through a network of backwoods outfitters, suppliers to their timber and mining operations. This was the birth of an industry. White men became involved in not only the buying of rice, but also its harvesting and processing. Although mechanical harvesting was outlawed in the 1920s to protect the native harvesting rights, mechanical processing continued to develop. And by the 1940s, the total U.S. and Canadian production approached one million pounds per year. 
At the time that I became commercially interested in wild rice in 1946, I would say that 50% of the rice that was being purchased uh, was being totally finished with primitive Indian facilities uh, and that about 50% had some mechanical augmentation. Uh, in a very short period of time, by the middle 1950s, we were in a poor year, exhausting every pound of rice, and our market exceeded that that was available, and the price of wild rice began to escalate very rapidly from a price, wholesale price of around 40 or 50 cents in 1946 or 7 to, uh, by 1959, I think it was, we were up to around wholesale price in excess of $5 a pound. At that point, well, even prior to that, but that was a great catalyst to the concept that it ought to be grown as an agricultural crop. And uh, people began to dream of the idea of, of domesticating what would literally be the first wild grain domesticated uh, in modern history. Cultivating wild rice was not an instant success. Attempts at farming wild rice frustrated growers well into the 1960s, when several discoveries were made. Farmers realized that wild rice paddies could be drained, allowing harvesting by dry land machinery. But there was still an old problem. The plants would shatter or lose many of the grains before harvest. A major breakthrough came in 1966 with the discovery of a non-shattering wild rice. Wheat, corn, and rice, oats, barley, and rye. These grains have been the principal food source of every major civilization since the beginning of recorded history. But man has adapted these grains to such an extent that their wild origins have all but disappeared their seeds losing the natural genetic diversity essential to the survival of the species. Fortunately, wild rice has not lost this broad genetic base. Although the damming of rivers and the draining of America's wetlands have decimated countless natural stands of wild rice, there still exist many varieties which have yet to be tapped for their genetic potential. Cereal grains are the single most important primary source of protein and carbohydrates in our food system. These specialized crops provide the basis for a global trading network and commodities market, a far cry from the days when man scratched a few acres of soil and scattered some wild seeds. But wild rice gives us a rare view of both worlds, for it is delicately rooted in its past in the face of an awesome and unfamiliar future among its civilized cousins. A lot of the older people depend on this stuff, you know, for, for a basic food item through the winter, you know. They used to be, you know, like uh, when we'd go racing in the fall of the year, it was, there's a lot of money in rice, you know, we'd get quite a bit for a pound of rice. And people would buy their, you know, kids' school clothes and stuff like that to start school with, you know. But they don't look forward to that so much anymore. And then it's really bad. You know, when the rice is short, like a year like this year, where we don't have much rice, you know, they should, uh, you would think the price of rice would go up a little bit, but it hasn't. Well, they got so many rice patties now, you know. So, I don't know. We're just lucky. I guess we can, we can be thankful that we did get any rice at all this year, you know. In view of the fact that wild rice potentially is one of the most, most, uh, generous of grains in its fold return in view of the fact that it is indigenous to an area far further north, far less, less tolerant climates than any other cereal grain in the world. It is, in my opinion, reasonable to presume that wild rice, as it is evolved by uh, genetic scientists, will be grown and prolifically and in great quantity in areas of the world that do not produce successfully today any cereal grain and that when it's available in those quantities its use in flour form and fermentation form will become significant we're going to see a grain which will significantly alter uh, 
the food base uh, of mankind uh, within a period of uh, 50 years. Whether wild rice will ever achieve the status of a major grain remains to be seen. But one thing is certain, that the past 50 years of wild rice development have been phenomenal. For the first time in modern history, and in the space of a single lifetime, man has successfully tamed a wild grain. Now he is faced with a new set of challenges, not the least of which may be to preserve the wild seed, lest its origins become another curious enigma to future generations. <laughs>